everyone who's joining us today. Uh, welcome to the first Fast Reactor uh, webinar um, of a series that we'll be having. So uh, to start, what we're going to be talking about today um, kind of covers a variety of aspects of Fast Reactors. You know, we're titling it Why Fast Reactors? And a discussion around shifting the world to a cleaner and more sustainable form of energy with fast vision technologies. And the idea here is, uh, as we've been, as, as we work together in kind of the future of bringing advanced nuclear to market and, and the broad potentials we have um, for global scalability, an important aspect, really or several important aspects, highlight the the value propositions that the fast te fast reactor technologies can bring. Um, and Part of what we wanted to do is, is start a webinar series to discuss and bring some of these different topical items uh, to light and kind of create a format of, of just awareness, but also information exchange so folks can be aware of both some of the exciting opportunities that are going on in the space, as well as some of the exciting developments happening and some of the things that we're looking forward to occurring. Um, so with that, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, start with this webinar series highlighting basically some of the broad generic things going on in the fast reactor um, space. And, and I'm excited to be joined today um, by Tara Neider, Steve Hayes, and Bob Hill. Uh, and uh, what we're gonna do is, this will be the first effectively amongst the series that we'll be bringing forward to you. The next one will be coming up to be announced, but we'll be focusing on some of the fuel cycle capabilities of fast reactors. And uh, from there, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to have more episodes or more webinars going forward that bring in different folks from the community, both from industry and the lab space, as well as academia, to discuss some of the things that are actively going on. So uh, first of all, thank you to everyone here who's joined us. Um, uh, and thanks to the panelists who are here. The format's gonna be a little bit different today. Uh, than what I think some panels have been in the past on webinars. So we're trying to make it a little more interactive. Um, in other words, what we'll be doing is doing a relatively quick set of introductions by each of us. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, we'll take it around and kind of have a pretty active roundtable or fireside chat type discussion. Um, as you have questions, please type them into the Q&A tab. Um, you'll see it below. Um, we'll be able to interject those as the conversation progresses. Um, and the idea is that we'll be talking amongst each other and asking questions amongst each other um, and hopefully stimulating a pretty dynamic conversation as this progresses. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Jacob DeWitt. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Oaklo. I'm also happy to chair the Fast Reactor Working Group. Um, I come from a background of nuclear that had a lot of, I'd say, focus on fast reactors in my education and my training. Um, and so I've always been pretty passionate and excited about the technology. That said, I think just the idea of splitting atoms is one of the most exciting things humankind has ever done. And being able to harness that energy peacefully is something that definitely has motivated us to both start this company and work so hard at trying to commercialize that. Um, we're working on a very small fast reactor system. It's initially designed to bringing power to remote and off-grid areas. Uh, we were excited about the use of fast reactor technologies because of what it enables in terms of um, long-lived core lifetimes, system simplicity, um, as well as the long-term resource sustainability that fast reactors provide. Uh, so that was kind of the one of the focus points for us as we started this. Um, and some of the benefits that we see in fast reactors are, are pretty crucial in terms of combining the fuel capabilities along with the simplicity as, as well as the safety characteristics in terms of what we see as a, as a broad avenue for fast reactor deployment in the future that we're working on as well as others. Um, so, so that's my quick introduction. Um, I'll now punt it over to Bob Hill next to, to quickly give his introduction and then we'll continue around the room and then um, kind of dive into the, the Q&A. So Bob, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Jake, and thank you for the opportunity to join the panel today. My name is Bob Hill. I'm a program leader at Argonne National Laboratory where I've been working on fast reactor technology and applications for more than 30 years. My current position is National Technical Director for Fast Reactor Research and Development Activities. Those are conducted in the Department of Energy Advanced Reactor Technologies Program. I'd like to give a little bit of background on fast reactors as well as the current R&D program. From the very beginning of nuclear energy, there was a recognition of some of the benefits of fast reactors and that reactors that rely on fast fissions have a better, more favorable neutron balance than reactors that rely on thermal neutrons. And it was recognized early on that this could be exploited to allow the fissile inventory to be sustained and also to extend the uranium resources significantly. 
The United States was a pioneer in this early technology development with several early demonstration fast reactors. The first energy from nuclear power was from the EBR-1 fast reactor in 1951. This was followed very quickly by the first commercial fast reactor, the Fermi-1 reactor in 1965, and the demonstration of fuel cycle in EBR-2. There have been many international programs also looking at fast reactor technology, and today, all the countries that have significant nuclear energy or aspire to have that continue to do work on fast reactor technology as one of their technology options for advanced nuclear energy. The current domestic program in the United States on fast reactor research and development is, our goal in that program is to, to create a sustained infrastructure. That infrastructure would be both the facilities and the expertise needed to support the commercial deployment of both current and fast fast reactors, excuse me, current and future fast reactors. To this end, um, we have R&D activities that are focused on two areas. The first area we're working on is technology innovations that are useful for cost reduction. This would be advanced materials, compact systems, a variety of other options. And the second main thrust is working on licensing issues. We need to have a pathway for the licensing of new reactor technologies that are not the same as the current LWR fleet in the United States. With that, I'd like to wrap up my brief intro and look forward to more detailed discussion of several of these issues this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. Next, Tara, do you mind jumping in and introing yourself? Sure. I'm Tara Neider, and I'm the Senior Vice President for the Program Development and Lab Facilities at TerraPower. I'm the Program Lead for the Sodium Reactor Development, which includes our Traveling Wave Reactor. Um, TerraPower is a nuclear innovation company based in Bellevue, Washington. The company originated with Bill Gates, Nathan Mirvolt, and John Gilliland. They evaluated the fundamental challenges um, for raising living standards around the world. And they recognized that energy access was really crucial to um, economic well-being and improvement of, of health. So um, they looked at all different energy sources and decided that nuclear was really the best fit. Um, and, and, um, and fast reactors particularly because of their inherent safety, um, reduced cost and, um, and efficient consumption of fuel. Um, so Fast reactors are far more efficient in burning fuel, can reduce the volume of waste by up to 80% over conventional designs. They allow for reactors to use depleted uranium, natural uranium, or in some cases spent fuel to uh, power reactors. This both helps um, put waste material to use, but also reduces proliferation risk by reducing the needs for enrichment capacity in host countries. It also allows for designs that can use different kinds of coolants, which have inherent safety features and can operate at higher temperatures, which increase efficiency of the power plants and allow for high temperature heat applications in the industrial sector. And all of these features can help us bring down the cost to build and operate new reactors. We have two reactors. The first one we developed was the traveling wave reactor. The idea behind the traveling wave, wave reactor is pretty simple. You, start, you need to start with some enriched uranium, but you place that near fuel assemblies with either depleted uranium or natural uranium. And the depleted or natural uranium has very low radioactivity, but when they are bombarded by neutrons from the enriched material, um, they can, um, they over time become powerful enough to generate heat to power uh, the reactor themselves. You leave the fuel in the reactor for a really long time and get more energy out of the fuel. The challenge is that this does happen over a long period of time, so it can do a, um, it can be pretty rough on materials. Um, so our focus on the TWR was really to develop the fuel and the fuel cladding um, to maintain, to withstand that harsh environment of high radiation and high temperature. Um, it also, and, and uh, we've made significant improvements in our cladding material, our fuel design and fuel manufacturing methods. We originally planned to, um, uh, to employ this, deploy this reactor in China, um, but that situation has now changed. So we refocused on the United States and are and really focusing on driving down the cost of, of sodium fast reactors. We have a second reactor um, under development. That's our molten chloride fast reactor. That reactor uses um, a uranium salt in a molten or liquid state. 
and the fuel flows through the reactor, so it acts as both the energy generator and the heat transfer mechanism. The MCFR has the promise of very low cost because you eliminate all of the fuel handling equipment and you don't need to shut down to refuel. Instead, um, you do what's called polishing and essentially remove the materials that you no longer want in your reactor um, through this polishing process. Uh, we're currently building an integrated effects test facility now in Everett, Washington, which will help us test the technology. And we hope to uh, do a minimum critical experiment with Idaho National Lab in the near future. This will demonstrate the technology on a small scale. Uh, both the reactors operate more efficiently, generate less waste, and are designed to operate in conjunction with energy storage technologies, utilizing high heat from our reactors to better integrate with grids with high penetrations of renewables. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate that. Next, uh, we'll have Steve wrap us up before we jump into the, the, uh, the conversation. Thanks, Jake. I uh, appreciate the invitation to be part of the panel here. Uh, so I am Steve Hayes. I'm director of the Nuclear Fuels and Materials Division at Idaho National Laboratory. Been here in Idaho about 30 years. I'm also the national technical director of DOE's Advanced Fuels Campaign, uh, where we help uh, the light water reactor industry uh, develop accent tolerant fuels, but we also do uh, have historically done R&D on fuels for advanced reactors and especially fast reactors. So just uh, starting out my introduction, a little bit about uh, my perspective on motivation for fast reactors. It, from, a, from my perspective, which is more of fuels, it really comes uh, down to high energy neutrons and an excess of neutrons over uh, light water reactors. Uh, the beauty of fast reactors and the excess neutrons that they create is you can use these neutrons for all sorts of different missions, uh, depending on what you want to do. In the early days, of course, uh, everyone was interested in using those excess neutrons for breeding, breeding new uh, fissile materials. Uh, more recently, we've been interested in using them for burning uh, off plutonium that we don't, don't want anymore. Uh, but it's not just the excess neutrons which lets you do things. It's also the fact that they're high energy. Uh, so uh, you can do things with high energy neutrons you can't do with thermal neutrons, like transmutation of long-lived actinides, fission products, if you want to achieve some sort of waste management uh, solution. Uh, so just the, the incredible uh, diversity of applications you can have with fast reactors. Of course, uh, the excess neutrons uh, we learned early on are maximized by a high density core, high density fuel. Back in the 80s, the US had what they called an advanced LMFDR fuels program, uh, looking at these, uh, looking at ultra high density fuels, carbides, nitrides, metallic fuels. And out of uh, that work especially really emerged in, in the US, uh, metallic fuels as the fast reactor uh, fuel developed and led uh, by the U.S. Of course, metallic fuels has a, a, have a higher density than all the other fuel options, so uh, they are, are able to maximize the breeding ratio, if that's what you want to do, or maximize burning uh, or transmutation, whatever your, your uh, interest is. Uh, we've also shown over decades that uh, metallic fuels have a potential for very high burnout. Uh, and in many recycle transmutation scenarios, high burnout is, can be very important. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, is really key to metallic fuels is that some of the intrinsic properties that they have that really aid in passive reactor safety that I, I think uh, Tara alluded to. Uh, and specifically things like high thermal conductivity, which results in just a low stored energy in the core. So if you find yourself in an accident situation, you've got a lot less energy you have to dissipate. And then the high thermal expansion uh, that metallic fuels exhibit really provide a big negative feedback, uh, negative reactivity feedback in a lot of the uh, important accident scenarios. Yeah. Put on top of that, uh, the fact that metallic fuels historically have been, have lent themselves to very 
uh, simple fabrication processes, typically casting processes, so they can be low, low cost and uh, easy to deploy, say in a hot cell or remote environment, uh, if you're coupling them with some sort of recycle uh, scheme. Uh, and then just uh, the, the uh, demonstration over many years, I would say, uh, that the fuel performance characteristics of metallic fuels are fairly insensitive to things like fabrication method or impurity levels or even variations in fuel composition. So again, it just lends itself as a technology that, that mates up well with fast reactors and some of the recycle schemes uh, that uh, you might be interested in using them for. So that's my introduction. I look forward to the interaction. Thanks so much, Steve. I appreciate that. And again, thank you for all of you who joined us on this panel today. So I think to get started, one question that I always think is interesting is, is kind of around why people got into working on this. So I'll actually pose this first to you, Bob, is, is you know, why, what, what got you first working on fast reactors? And then also, why have you stuck with it, you know, for, for your career so far? Yeah, so I started working on fast reactors back in graduate school. And a lot of the issues that we've talked about and what some of the benefits are from fast spectrum systems were what we learned as nuclear engineers in school. So they were of interest at that point. Um, one, I think, unique aspect um, in my career path is while I was in graduate school, which would be 1986, was when they did the very unique severe accident tests in, at the EBR2 reactor that showed that these types of reactors also have very unique safety features, that you can subject them to very, very severe accident conditions and they will just adjust their power level to whatever the ability it is for you to remove the heat. So I think both the combination of some of the more traditional benefits of fast reactors combined with some of the improved safety performance and really robust operational conditions for these reactors really showed a unique technology that could go on. And if you think there's going to be nuclear, the more nuclear you have, the more important some of the features become of the fast reactor systems. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I'll kind of jump after you and add to that. I think it's kind of a similar story. I, I saw exposure to it in school. I think the very first time was um, kind of early when we were studying different reactor type systems. and having a chance to learn about, you know, a reactor system that used alternative coolants that had very high power density capability. And then also this broad fuel cycle of sensibility was pretty fascinating. And then I think having kind of a flagship, you know, senior design course in undergrad where we were designing reactors that could help consume waste and, and looking at the broad benefits, you know, start actually started working on a system that was somewhat thermal in nature, but fertile free. Uh, and then saw as you tune the spectrum out to be harder and harder, you got all these huge benefits and then ultimately capped off with some of the research I had and, and, and uh, well, an internship I had at GE Hitachi working on the prism design got me really, I think, into the technology space and started to understand it and had the chance to well, first get to know you, Bob, there, and then from there expand into grad school. And I think one of the things that's so captivating and compelling about the technology is, is how globally scalable it is. And I think personally, that's one of the most exciting things because you think about the scope of the problem we face, we have to do something that's kind of at that scale. And in terms of what fast reactors can do, especially with resource use is, is, is critical to realizing that. Um, I think after that, Tara, I'd be kind of curious what got you working into the space and kind of what your initial introduction was and what personally motivates you about it. Okay, so I'm a little bit different. I started late. Uh, I joined TerraPower about four years ago. And uh, prior to that, I was with Ariva for most of my career. And, um, you know, I, although I, I loved all the things that I did at Ariva, eventually it became uh, focusing more on the... Um, on, on shutting down reactors and decommissioning them. And um, to be honest, it was not a good place to be in my head. Um, I, it's not fun to put a react, put a industry to bed. It's much more to much more fun to actually see something growing and alive. And the fast reactors really allows a resurgence of the of the nuclear industries. And um, and a couple of things that I really like about fast reactors is first of all. 
um, it gets you away from water. Uh, water is a pain because it requires high pressures and turns into steam that needs to be bottled up in a containment. But in a fast reactor, you typically use a coolant like sodium or salt, um, and it operates at a, at a very low pressure and high temperature, which is intrinsically safer. It also opens up a pathway to unlimited energy, whether through reprocessing or once through um, breed and burn, fast reactors allow you to get a whole lot more energy out of a piece of uranium. Since you're able to burn um, uranium-238, uh, which is 99.3% of the uranium atoms versus um, mostly U-235, which is um, only 0.7% of uh, natural uranium. So it's it's a good it's a good um, industry. It's it, it really can bring a lot to the nuclear industry. Thanks, Tara. I appreciate that. That's it's good context too, given the fact that there's kind of a diversity of backgrounds that get people into this and bring in a different experience set that starts to see some of the value propositions of it. Steve, I remember the first time I met you, you were talking about getting into it when EBR two was operating and kind of excitement about the fuel side. So I'd be curious if you could share that story with the rest of the folks who've joined us and elaborate on it as well about what got you into the into the space sure uh and there's there's a lot of overlap with uh, bob's story since we both started uh about the same time <clears throat> i showed up uh, in idaho uh, in the late 1980s i was a graduate student looking for an internship uh, came to argonne west as it was called in, in those days uh, the, these were the days of the integral fast reactor program uh, which was centered around testing in and with EBR2. Uh, and EBR2, as Bob mentioned, had just uh, in recent years completed really a historic series of experiments they called the shutdown heat removal tests, um, which demonstrated on a reactor level that a, a sodium cool fast reactor could be made to just naturally shut itself down without operator action or even active control rod movement under various accent scenarios, really demonstrating uh, passive safety uh, features and an approach that we kind of take for granted today. Uh, that was the start of all of it. And the exciting thing for me as a fuels person was that a key part of that passive safety response was due to the properties of metallic fuels, like I mentioned in my intro. So. And after that internship, I, get, I became a true believer in uh, the potential fast reactors, especially metallic fuel fast reactors. And uh, I've been, been in the R&D uh, world, uh, working on them to a greater or lesser extent for about the last 30 years. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Well, one topic we've had come up in the questions is, the fact that we've had multiple fast reactors and we've had fast reactors built around the world. And what are some of the issues that have been demonstrated by the current experience with those fast reactors? And what are some of the reasons why this reactor technology has not been commercially deployed given the previous demonstrations? I just wanted to give a little bit of perspective first on what has been demonstrated. So there's about 300 operating years of fast reactors of the test reactor size, the smaller reactor size, and about 100 operating years at more the demonstration size where you would generate electricity from these reactors. So the about 400 operating years of experience are out there. With the most favorable experience being the Russian BN600 reactor, which oper has operated since 1980 with a 75% capacity factor. So beyond just showing you can make the reactors critical, you've shown the ability in, with these reactors to have reliable operations over decades of a time period. So some of the challenges to commercial deployment of this technology are really some of the same challenges in the United States that we've had with other reactors. About the 1980s, 1990s, when you were looking to go to performance demonstrations of fast reactors, it's the same time period when there were lots of LWR constructions that were being either deferred or outright canceled at that point in time. So you really were on the brink of doing some of the commercial demonstration of this technology when you had a contraction of the nuclear energy industry in the United States. So there's a bad timing issue um, is one of the big issues on the United States, at least, on why this, this technology has not been commercialized to date. So that's one of the, what I would say is one of the main issues as far as just a timing issue for the fast reactors in the United States as far as commercial deployment. 
Anybody else like to comment on that? Yeah, I'd like to comment on it. I, I think the uh, the uh, real reason that that uh, fast reactors haven't take, taken off as much as they should have is that um, it has been economics. And um, part of that was through excessive regulation. And um, the, you know, the NRC is working on that to, to help um, improve that um, uh, the, the regulation. We really need to focus on safety significant issues within the licensing, um, licensing program and, and only those safety significant things because if we focus on everything and make it as complicated and as detailed as, as we have to for safety significant items, then everything becomes less safety significant. However, I do think the NRC is really focusing on this, this right now. The other thing is that nuclear reactors have typically had a long construction period. It takes large civil structures. There's um, large on-site reactor uh, fabrication. Um, sodium has in, in intermediate list um, loops and there's sodium fire risks. So what we've done at TerraPower is really focused on, um, on driving down both the um, construction and the operating costs. Um, and what we've seen is that we can eliminate a lot of systems um, and the cost of the react reactor dramatically decreases. I think part of this is that, that um, fast reactors have typically been developed for test purposes and not for commercial operation. Um, so now really focusing on the financial aspects of the reactor design is key for, for our success going forward. Thanks, Sarah. I think that's, that's fantastic context and I think a really good perspective on why you know there's this diversity of activity in this space is, is I think Tara hit it on, a, on hit the nail on the head which is about the simplification potential that I think these reactor technologies have and that drives a lot of economic upside um, and I think a really key point is the fact that there has been a long history of developing um, you know reactors more from research and test and experimentation perspectives and obviously when you do that it's a different vector towards what the product's going to look like than commercialization. Tara one thing I'm curious if you could talk a little more just on what you said is when you kind of look at that that combination of um, you know the reasons, I guess why there's sort of an exciting time right now. I'm curious, what what are some of the things that are most exciting to you that are going on right now in terms of helping enable this? I would say deployment, commercially speaking, that we're looking at um, in terms of you know both R and D side related things as well as as well as policy related. Um. Some of the things I think is that the labs have really opened up to let's let's figure out a way to take the um, reactors from an R and D world to um, to deployment. Uh, I'm very excited about the the um, uh, advanced demo program going on right now, but also in terms of um, you know the things that Enric is doing and uh, the effort to combine nuclear with um, with uh, uh, with renewable energy is is pretty exciting. Um, we're going to be hopefully doing a a, um, a test with Idaho on our um, molten chloride fast reactor, which uh, will demonstrate a, a very unique um, type of design. Um, and also in terms of um, of fuel development, uh, I think that. Uh, pursuing the uh, versatile test reactor is going to be key. We had been previously um, doing a lot of irradiation in Bohr 60 in, in Russia, and uh, we're happy to bring that home. That's a, a un very good, unique perspective, given the fact that you guys have been working for a while on looking at the irradiation capability. So I think that brings up a really good point, which is one of the exciting attributes, or I should say characteristics and endeavors going on right now in the U.S. As as you pointed out, there's an array of activities going on, and one of one of the flagship activities is around the versatile test reactor. Which, for folks who aren't familiar, that's you know a program going on right now with the Department of Energy in the U.S. to build a new um, fast neutron test facility, basically a fast test reactor. Uh, so you know, I know there's a variety of folks who are involved on this call more than I am. So I'd love to get the thoughts from honestly the whole panel. Steve, I, I'd be curious, you know, other works going on there. What are some of the key things that a um, basically a versatile test reactor will give us in terms of irradiation capabilities? And what does that look like in terms of you? Know, we've talked about technology being ready. We see stuff we can do now. What does that look like though for what tomorrow looks like for next generation fuel forms? What are some of the opportunities you see with this facility providing us? as an industry? Yeah, uh, VTR is very exciting, uh, certainly is. While it 
it ought to be able to do many things to help fast reactors in general. As you allude to, the most exciting thing for me is the opportunity it'll bring to test and qualify new fuels for future fast reactors. Uh, for, for someone like you or Tara who wanted to build a, a fast reactor today, you're really faced with probably two fuels as choices, oxide fuels or metallic fuels. Those are the fuels that have historically been used in fast reactors. There's probably enough data in hand to convince the regulators uh, to license the ne next fast rea reactor with oxide or metal fuels, but you probably can't do um, everything you want to do uh, on day one, even with those fuel forms. Um, uh, so uh, what the VTR does is it, it brings to the table the ability to qualify new fuels um, uh, for future fast reactors. Now, now we're certainly doing a testing of fast reactor fuels today in the thermal test reactors that we have like ATR. Uh, but they are limited uh, in that they cannot achieve the genuinely prototypic testing environment that you need to answer some of the questions you'll need to answer about new fuels. And, and the beauty of VTR, it'll be able to provide that prototypic uh, testing environment that looks like a real fast reactor. So, uh, so we, can, we can do the testing needed to qualify, qualify new fuels. And those are fuels, uh, even, even though VTR is gonna be a sodium cooled test reactor, it, it'll be able to provide the ability uh, to test fast reactor fuels in a prototypic way, whether you're looking at a future sodium cooled fast reactor, lead cooled, gas cooled, even, even molten salt. So uh, the ability to qualify new fuels or extend the qualification envelope for a, a fuel that, that you may, uh, want to use early on. That, that's what BTR does for you. I, that's a very good point, Steve. I think one thing that stems from that that's useful to, to kind of con bring up is there's some, you know, just a little context to the fast reactor working group. I, I realize that sometimes when people hear fast reactor, they may think of just one type of technology. And I think one of the really cool things about our group is the fact that we span a variety of technologies. One of the neat things about fast base fast reactor type systems is you're really relying on fast neutrons to cause fission. And there's a whole bunch of ways you can cause that to happen. Some of which I think are some of the most exciting innovations going on in advanced reactor technology development. That includes using sodium as a coolant, right? A very capable coolant. Using lead as a coolant gives you some similar benefits in terms of metallic capabilities. Um, and then using gas, um, which can allow for potentially higher temperature operations. Um, there's some interesting work going on with new technologies around that system. And then, and then also on the molten salt side where you're using, you know, generally speaking, uh, chloride based salts uh, to then have the fuel dissolved into that and have the fuel and coolant sort of mixed up in one. And the fact is, like Steve said, there's, there's a strong legacy on the sodium fast reactor side with the two fuels that were discussed, but you know, as those look going forward, you can combine different attributes and different capabilities and unlock different things going on with the different spec, like different types of reactors, different flavors being developed. I think it's one of the neat things we see is that we have such an array of, um, of activities going on with different types of reactors, given the benefits they have. One thing I'm kind of curious that bridges, Steve, just from what you said, and I'll just throw this to anyone, honestly, is what you guys think right, right now, could you talk a little bit more about the status of VTR and what the timelines look like around that? And then, and then kind of the natural extension that goes from VTR and what you said, Steve, is talking about the exciting art research and development activities that are, are kind of going on in the fast reactor space. If you guys could, I'd be curious to just kind of see what people think. And, and Bob, I guess I'll bump those honestly to you after I said I'll go around the room, but I'll start with you, Bob, and we'll kind of spin it around. Yeah, so we've, we've seen the schedules for, for VTR, which is starting operations in 2025, 2026 timeframe. Um, we're doing, facing very soon the CD1 decision, which is critical decision one, at which point you'll start the detailed design work for the VTR and then construction work out of ways. And the, again, the goal there is startup of the reactor system in 2026. So very, very quick pathway to developing the technology. And there's been a lot of work done um, on the conceptual design in order to get to this point. And there's a very detailed cost estimate as part of that conceptual design, which will be refined and the risk reduced on it over time as we go forward on that. Um, one, one thing on Steve's previous, I just wanted to, to raise on one thing, when we haven't had a fast test reactor, which we haven't in the United States since 1995, it really 
makes it hard to come up with new ideas for fuel forms and to be able to test them. I think the, the group that's been doing that research has been very creative and doing what they can. But I think if we have a domestic capability and that ability to do that, what you will see beyond what we know today, and wanting to qualify some specific things, you'll see new ideas and new fuel forms that are stimulated by having that device, device and the ability to test in it. That's right. The way I like to say it is we're doing fast reactor fuel testing in uh, thermal test reactors, some very uh, specialized testing configurations. And, but, but what we're doing is, is fuel performance testing that's relevant to fast reactor fuels. We're, we're not going to be able to answer every question that will need to be answered for a, for a new fuel form because we can't achieve the prototypic uh, conditions. Uh, in these experiments. So, so uh, that's a real limitation for us. So we're going to need some, we're going to need VTR or something like a VTR uh, to, to push forward on, with new fast reactor fuels. Steve, on that one question that, you know, I'm always intrigued by going on, but you know, there, there's a long history obviously with fast reactor fuel development going on with a strong focus on metallic fuels and then oxide fuels and you know, generally speaking, metallic fuels being the flagship technology. What are some of the exciting advancements that have been being explored on that? And what's on the horizon for the technology in terms of general performance improvements and capability improvements? Exactly. Um, so in the, in the U.S. Uh, last 10, 15 years, so we, we've been pushing forward metallic fuel technology as well as some of the other uh, technology for fast reactor fuels, but the things we've really been been focusing on really kind of three areas. Uh, one, and this goes back ten or fifteen years, when when the the interest was more focused on using fast reactors for uh, burning plutonium, trans uh, transmuting uh, actinide materials that uh, build up in LWRs. Uh, we really spent a lot of time demonstrating acceptable fuel performance on a wide variety of, uh, under a wide variety of recycle or transmutation scenarios, where the composition of the fuel is moving around, where you're getting a lot of carryover of fission products from uh, your recycle, or you're just bringing things over into your fuel that you want to transmute. Um, and so, so we've, We've, we've looked at fast reactor fuels for that application quite a bit in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, of great interest to TerraPower, in fact, we've been working with them also to show that uh, burn-up capability could be dramatically expanded uh, or increased for metal fuels. So, so metal fuels in EBR2 or even an FFTF typically operated to 10% burn-up. Uh, back in the integral fast reactor days, uh, there were experiments that showed that 20% was possible. But companies like TerraPower, they want to go to 30 or 40%. And so you, you've got to change some of the things uh, you do in the design to get to that level. We've been working on that, uh, some good, good potential there. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I would just say, um, uh, we, we, and this is more recent, we've been looking at non-sodium bonded metallic fuel concepts and designs. Historically, uh, metallic fuels have put liquid sodium in that fuel cladding gap um, uh, just to promote heat transfer and uh, also be, be a fluid that can be easily displaced to accommodate fuel swelling. Um, the problem is having elemental sodium in your used fuel creates some disposition issues. You generally are faced with treating your, your spent fuel before disposing of it. But if you had a metal fuel without the sodium bond, it would lend itself towards direct disposal and, and give reactor designers just a lot of different fuel management options. So those, those are the areas we've been mostly working in the last decade or, or so. That's great, Steve. And I think naturally kind of stemming from that because there's a lot of interesting things going on in the fuel side. Um, one kind of follow-up question I have for you is, is what's currently going on right now in that space actively? 
Well, so we've had a little bit of a setback this year with the FY20 appropriation. Actually, the, the DOE funded program looking at fast reactor fuels uh, was zeroed out this year. Uh, so the, the work of the last uh, decade has come to a halt this year. Uh, we're certainly hoping to uh, resurrect it in future years. I think it's critical uh, to, uh, well, it, it's a critical time, especially with VTR on the horizon, especially with the industry uh, interest in uh, fast reactor demos and, and even uh, deployments. Uh, I think uh, we need to get the DOE uh, fuels program back in place. Wholeheartedly agree to that. Um, so I guess one thing I'll just mention, I think folks have maybe noticed, um, Tara, unfortunately, your video cut out. She said she's in a little bit of a remoter area, so sometimes the uh, video connections may not be stable, but she's still with us. So one question I'm kind of curious, Tara, is based on what Steve was saying, obviously some of the exciting R&D opportunities going around in fuels. I'd be curious to hear you talk about that from your your perspective um, at Terra Power. What's kind of some of the things on R&D that are that are most interesting to you and kind of most um, most exciting in terms of fast reactor technology development, broadly speaking. Yeah, um, backing up on what uh, what Steve said is TerraPower has been very interested in, in fuel development and, um, and we've undertaken pretty much as much as we can within the um, um, the other test reactors like the advanced test reactor. We've done some testing and, and and modeled with INL how that could simulate what a fast um, fast spectrum uh, would look like from the fuels and those tests came out very, very well. Um, we've taken our cladding materials and, um, and uh, really um, tightened them up some so that uh, to get better performance out of that and we have demonstrated that better performance in like I said through irradiation at, at bore 60 um, but we are bringing all those samples back to the United States and we're preserving them so that we can continue that testing um, with the VTR if, if that gets um, you know if that gets started up which seems like it's on a pretty good path right now um, and we also um, are excited about um, the fact that you know treat is now open again. So so we are planning on doing uh, transient testing on our fuel as well, uh, which is which is something that uh, we don't have that much data on, um, and I uh, look forward to the, the uh, answers from those tests. Thanks, Tara. That kind of bridges over, Bob. Obviously, facilities and infrastructure are important. We've talked a lot about VTR, but can you talk a little bit about the different capabilities that, that you all have at Argonne and just broadly speaking exist around the lab complex and some of the R&D associated activities with those? Yeah, so some of the exciting new things that we're looking at, Jake, are we're doing quite a bit of work on new structural materials for fast reactors and for liquid metal reactors in particular. If you look at the demonstrations that have been done around the world, they pretty much use 1960s vintage steels and, and materials like that. So we're working on new materials that will be able to be significantly higher strength for the same cost and therefore should be able to lead to economic benefits for the system as a whole. We're also looking at, there's been a variety of design techniques, both for the system configuration to make it more compact and for the construction techniques. And applying those to fast reactor technology, again, offers significant cost savings as we go forward. So like we've developed a liquid metal component testing facility called METL, where we're looking at the parts of a fuel handling machine, which is one of the complicated pieces of equipment for a fast reactor and important to get the system size down and to make the system more compact. We've also are really trying to utilize to the best way possible um, significant improvements in recent years in modeling and simulation capabilities. These are useful really in two aspects. They're useful because they help us to better optimize the system because we can come up with better configurations and model it better. But they're also very important for the safety assurance and the licensing. We've done a lot of work on validating what's going on in the safety modeling and the transient modeling and then the ability to show that and to do it at a higher fidelity will help to make these systems, again, simpler and more compact, which will get the cost of the systems down. Jake, you've um, recently submitted an application to the NRC. Could you give us some information about that? 
Yeah, I think it hits an interesting question. Uh, um, you know, we've we've talked a lot about R and D, what's going on, and I think it's it's fun to actually talk about some of the stuff as well that's going on concurrently in terms of commercialization. One thing we like to talk about or think about internally, and I think talk about externally, is it's kind of the innovation curve and talking about what's happening now and the fact that technology is already now, but also the R and D activities going on that just help enhance the economic case going forward. I think you know. From our perspective, you know, we're focusing on a very small system, leverages a lot of experience from metallic fuels development and EBR2 and FFTF, as well as some fundamental safety characteristics that were discussed uh, a little bit earlier. And, uh, you know, we saw a pretty clear opportunity to take those forward and um, pursue a commercial license application with the technology that's very mature. Um, you know, the, the reality is fast reactors have a long history of development and maturity in this country. And as we look at what they can do now, it's pretty compelling. And then it only gets more compelling as we look at the future, especially as we look at driving costs down to ultimately which we're all working for cost competitiveness and cost superiority to everything else that's out on the market. And, uh, you know, fast reactors help us do that with system simplification and the use of, I'd say, more widely available materials. And I think one of the key things that's different going on in the U.S. right now, and one of the differences that Terry, you said, um, is that there's right now a flurry of activity around commercializing real actual power plants, like actual commercial systems and not just R&D facilities. And I think that's a huge differentiator from what's happened historically. But also, I think it's important to highlight the fact that there's a lot of innovation going on right now that spans beyond just the technical side, but includes business models, that includes financing models, that includes regulatory models, which is my lead up to answer your question, which we submitted, you know, the first ever combined license application to the NRC for an advanced reactor under Part 52. Um, uh, that we're pretty excited about. Uh, we've submitted it in March. Um, we've been working with the NRC in formal pre-application since 2016 uh, to familiarize them with the design. Tara, one thing you mentioned was the NRC has been going through a lot of work to, I'd say, modernize and get ready for advanced reactors. And we've we've generally been, you know, we've been working um, to familiarize them and get ready to be able to review an application up through now. And uh, I think we're starting to see what that looks like. And in general, we've been pretty pleased. I think there's a lot of progress the NRC has made to be able to look at advanced technologies that really root fundamentally back to the regulations. One of the things we were proud of at Oklahoma was also pioneering a new application structure that ultimately builds from the regulations uh, and stems that back into an application structure that's a lot more, I would say, uh, streamlined, but also focused on the things that actually drive the safety case. Um, one of the nice things about fast reactors, you have a lot of inherent and passive safety characteristics by design um, that you can then use to basically articulate and meet well, the safety case and meet the regulatory requirements. Um, one of the one of the things we've seen so far is you know the NRC is taking on I think they've shown a willingness to accept a very new application structure which I think is really impressive. Um, we're excited about what this starts to look like and how this progresses. Um, there's still a lot of work to do though. Uh, at the end of the day, this is new. This is different. Um, and so you know we're working with them uh, to ultimately get to the place where not only can reviews be done, but they need to be done efficiently, right, and cost effectively. And right now, I think we see a vector where that looks really promising. And that's really exciting because it's not just for us, but it's for everybody. We kind of knew that we would be the tip of the spear. We were willing and kind of excited to do that and wanted to set forward some really bold thinking about ideas of how you can really lean into the technological capabilities of these systems. And, and so far, we've seen the NRC be pretty receptive to that. I think that that also ushers in, I think, a really important economic characterization here that, that we talked a little bit about, which is, why can this be so successful now for fast reactor economics? And, and the reality, I think, stems from system simplification, having fewer parts, having uh, a design that is very robust and simple and its side enables really cheaper things to happen, right? What I mean by that is having a plant that's cheaper. Um, and for us, we, we've seen that that ultimately gets tried out in the regulatory space as well. And that's what we're working on now. And ideally this starts to lend itself towards, okay, you have systems that have a lot of inherent and passive safety characteristics that should then enable cheaper designs that basically, you know, get rid of some of the challenges that have otherwise led to certain cost pressures in certain other areas. And so we, we, th we think it's a pretty exciting time right now, not just for what we're doing, but for everybody. Um, and actually that kind of bridges into another point, which is, you know, we talked a lot about the activities going on in the U.S. about developing these technologies. But one of the other points that stems from this is a lot of developers are looking at also licensing these technologies in other countries. Canada being a foremost example with one of our fast reactor working group members, advanced reactor concepts doing a lot of work actively in Canada and a lot of us also looking at opportunities to license in Canada. One of the things I'm, I'm kind of curious by is, you know, and, and I'd be, well, well, I'll make a quick comment and I, I'd love to just kind of throw this out to the, the panelists here is, what does it look like, you know, 
in terms of taking R and D capabilities uh, that the labs have and all this data that's been generated here and being able to work with international groups, it's going to be very important to be able to draw, you know, the technological bases for why we're designing these reactors the way they are and how, why they're safe and meeting regulatory requirements based on data we've developed in this country. So, you know, one thing we've seen is there's a plethora of data. It's very usable in the U.S. paradigm. Um, but one thing I'd be curious by is, you know, commentary folks have is they look at taking it internationally, Canada being a good example. So, you know, for example, the CNSC may not have the same access to that information. So obviously, how do we, how do we bridge that? I think one area that's very doable there is the partnerships between the U.S. and Canada on the regulatory side it should show a lot of promise there. But I'd be curious, Bob, if there's anything you want to add. And honestly, if anyone else wants to say anything else about this, um, I'd be curious what people what people are seeing in terms of how we can enhance our international collaborations. I know there's already work going on that it makes it really sophisticated, but just further enhance those so that we can license these technologies in other places. Yeah, so there's been a lot of international work through the IAEA and the NRC is actually very heavily engaged on, on the working group on the safety of advanced reactors, which is trying to look at some of these issues and where possible to make these things consistent because they certainly aren't today. Um, if you look at the regulations across different countries, they vary a lot. And as far as on the data and, and being able to use what we've developed in this country, we're, we've been focused primarily at the moment on being able to use that data within the NRC context. We've done quite a bit of work on the co compiling and, and systematizing the data that we already have on hand and then how we can use it in a licensing context because some of this is from basically the 1980s, 1990s testing of some of these fuel forms. Um, one other aspect of this, Jake, that I'd like to get comments from, from you and from Tara on is there have been some challenges um, internationally with fast reactor demonstration projects. And what do you see that's unique on the situation in the United States that you, you think we are able to do this today and to start to move towards commercialization of this technology and making it work in the United States? Okay, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, first of all, I think what, um, what makes me most proud of being an American, quite frankly, is that, that the U.S. really does have a culture of innovation, and certainly in the fast reactor business, the U.S. is um, utilizing that innovation. At, at TerraPower, just because that's what I'm familiar with, um, we have developed a lot of um, advanced computing capabilities so that we can, um, like with our Army program, we can actually model a reactor core and get instantaneous answers, and those models are very, very simple to to develop so you can look at all sorts of different um, uh, configurations in a very short period of time. Um, so we can can uh, actually, I think, optimize designs a lot a lot easier. Um, we do have we do really have challenges though on the U.S. side, and 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 that is really with our export control. Um, we probably are the most um, uh, conscientious company about non-proliferation in the world and um, and that limits our ability to go to too many many uh, countries obviously that's why we're no longer in in uh, China but um, but we do have to be able to um, share our technology and they have to be able to validate that technology in our friendly friendly uh, country partners that's that's awesome Tara I, I think I'll just echo some of that real quickly and um, I think that there are a lot of things that are very promising in what's happening in the U.S. And I think sourcing the development out to, a, I think, in the sense of letting industry drive a lot of these innovations is a pretty key enabler in, in partnering with the government in the right ways, specifically the national laboratories and the capabilities, as well as bringing in significant amounts of private capital with a long focus on actual you know, deployment, commercial deployment and, and commercially deployed power plants creates a pretty successful roadmap that's different than I think what the history has been in other countries. And I think one example that's useful to point to is what the Russian has, Russians have been doing um, and the success they've had with their fast reactor programs. And ultimately, it also similar with what we've done in the U.S., stemming back to the success we had with DBR2. It's a pretty uh, compelling story in terms of what a technology can do. So, I think those are kind of the the things that are pretty interesting right now about what those what those look like. Um, one comment I'll just make logistically is uh, we are folding in some of these questions we see coming in that folks ask, answering them kind of dynamically. Um, also, this is being recorded. Um, so as we wrap up here over the next few minutes, we'll be able to post this up online um, and then folks will be able to, to review it. It'll take us a, a few days to get that out, but we will put it up. Um, so real quick, jumping back into this, I think 
one thing I'm kind of curious by is, you know, we, I think we talk a little bit about the, well, we talk about the economic upside that comes from system and design simplification. I think one thing that enables that is kind of focused around the question of how fast reactors can manage, if not eliminate severe accidents. So Bob, I'm curious if you can maybe talk a little bit about the general fast reactor characteristics that enable really that strong inherent and passive safety response and how that's actually been demonstrated <laughs> with real systems as well. Yeah, so I think this is an important issue, Jake, and this is one of the reasons why today's fast reactor can be less expensive than the ones, the demonstration plants that were built in the 1980s, because they were in a rush to build some of the initial reactors, and they just took some of the techniques and what was used for other types of reactor designs and applied them to the fast reactor technology as best they could. And what we showed in some of the inherent safety testing, which was really focused here in the United States, is we showed the ability to prevent severe accidents and prevent fuel failure for what would normally be considered very, very bad conditions for these reactors. And so when we can do designs then that can reflect those characteristics, some of the key characteristics as Steve mentioned are the high thermal conductivity of the metal fuel, which leads to low stored heat, which leads to very good behavior in many types of accident scenarios. And when we use that and we know that and when you can do the design around those facts, you can come up with less expensive configurations for the systems. And you should be able to use that to reduce the cost of these reactors as we go forward. I think Bob, a similar question that kind of comes up um, is, is, is on the fuel side. I guess one thing I'd be curious by, and, and, and this I'll punt to Bob and Steve, you know, from a technological standpoint, what are some of the biggest challenges that need to be overcome in order to to basically deploy some of these advanced recycling technologies to integrate into fast reactor designs? And you know, what are some of the opportunities around that? You wanna take that one, Steve? Well, I can start and you, you can probably add a lot to it. I, I, I think economics is a real issue. Uh, uh, fast reactors have historically been more expensive and therefore less competitive. Uh, even without the recycling component uh, factored in. Uh, there, there's some good work going on uh, to improve that situation. But recycling uh, is an added expense, and you have to be able to recoup those costs in some way. Uh, the DOE program of 10 or 15 years ago was looking at recouping some of those costs in the waste management and fuel disposition benefits that can be gained. Uh, for instance, if you do uh, transmutation uh, of long-lived uh, actinide materials as part of your fuel scheme, your, your, your scenario, that gives you huge benefits potentially in the uh, spent fuel repository uh, space, uh, not having to license a, a repository for hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps uh, only having to license it for uh, under a thousand years and, and much less material going into it. So if, if you're gonna do recycle, economics is gonna be an issue and you have to find a way uh, to take advantage of, uh, of, of that. Bob, you wanna? Yep, I, I, I agree with you, Steve. Um, I think, I hope there's going to be a future webinar dealing with these fuel cycle issues because I think especially for the metal alloy fuel farms, we do have some technology options and some innovations there that offer the same type of promise as we've talked about for fast reactor systems for getting the cost down and getting these systems more effective. Another thing that Steve talked about, and I saw this in some of the other questions online, is this is really the aspect um, for the fuel cycle area where you've talked about mixes of reactor systems. You can envision fast reactors as enabling and moving in, in parallel with thermal reactor systems in order to help with the waste management or to help with some of the recycle of some of the key materials from those. Now, given that, there's also a lot of interest today in fast reactors, um, regardless of fuel cycle issues, because you also can get much higher burnups with a single pass through fast reactors, which is another way to try to take advantage of the unique capabilities of fast reactors. 
That's a great point. I, I will use that before we jump into kind of our last little go of some comments. Uh, we will be having a future webinar uh, that will, several, <laughs> that will be dealing with some of the fuel cycle sides um, in addition to other ones that focus on different technological innovations there. One thing I think is very interesting, and, and I'll just say this, um, that, that came out from Argonne recently, was a report looking at the conceptual design of a pyroprocessing facility. And if you look at that cost of that facility and then look at the costs of the produced transuranics that could be used to fuel fast reactors from that, um, it can be done in a way that's cost competitive, if not better, frankly, than um, producing high assay low enriched uranium. Uh, that produces a really interesting economic paradigm. And I think that's one of the cool things happening in the space right now is we're looking towards a future where you know, the, the narrative is now focusing more on what fast reactors and what advanced reactors as a whole can do um, in terms of you know, broad deployment commercially, both economically as well as just from an environmental perspective. But then if you add in uh, a cheaper fuel source, you start to, that's decoupled from having to just build the reactors, you start to have, bring in a very different, I think, economic paradigm, which is pretty exciting. Um, one thing I, I'll, I'll go to and in, 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 in just kind of run through real quick on a few different items. Um, one is, uh, Bob, can you talk a little bit about the different size ranges of fast reactors that have been looked at in terms of power? And then also, you know, the aspects of the variety of fast reactor technologies being looked at, is there, you know, what their capability is to also provide, for example, process heat and, and kind of what that range looks like? Yep. So size wise, we, we've really got the full range. Um, the, uh, the re your recent license application, Jake, was for a micro reactor type size, really, of these reactors. And then they range all the way up to the Japanese, their latest Japanese, Japan sodium fast reactor is 1500 megawatts electric. But I think one key for all those, even for the large systems as well as the small systems, there's been a lot of focus on the SMR type issues on trying to maximize the amount of modular fabrication. And you really see that reflected in some of the most recent designs. Um, so that was for the size. There was another question, Jake, besides the size issue. Just their ability to produce other products. Um, so other products. So, so the... The most mature fast reactor technology, which is the sodium technology, is limited to about 500 degrees C outlet. So it's a, it's a step up from the 300 degrees where we are for LWRs, but it's not going to get to the high temperatures of some of the other types of systems. And this is one of the motivators for, the, for groups that are looking at lead-cooled fast reactors or gas-cooled fast reactors or the molten salt-cooled fast reactors, is to try to get up to even higher temperatures to open up an even larger market for some of these non-electrical applications. But we do have at the 500 degrees C in the previous demonstration reactors, they've used them for a wide variety of things other than electricity production. We've done, for instance, they've, they've, de they've desalinated water in previous demonstration fast reactors and other products that you could easily envision at those types of temperatures. Thanks, Bob. So I think with that, we'll just kind of um, go around and do kind of a quick wrap up um, before signing off. Uh, so uh, I'll start with you, Steve, kind of going in inverse of the introductions. Um, you know, just if, if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing some of your perspectives on, on the conversation today, as well as a few kind of things that stick out to you that you really look forward to over the course of the next few days or next few years and, and longer in terms of the future well, for, uh, for fast reactors. Thanks. So I, I really appreciate being part of this conversation and uh, it's been enjoyable. Uh, I've been excited about fast reactors and the benefits they could potentially bring for 30 years. I, that excitement has not diminished. Uh, I think uh, uh, metallic fuels uh, even uh, multiply the possibilities, which is kind of my area, uh, but, but, but it doesn't have to be metallic fuels. But I think the exciting thing uh, in, the mo in recent years is now the commercial interest. Uh, okay, 30 years ago, it was mostly DOE pushing uh, R&D. And now we have companies like Oklo and TerraPower, others uh, who are ready to build demonstration plants, perhaps deploy reactors. Uh, that's the exciting thing. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, Tara, you mind... Uh sharing your thoughts next. Um, sure, I um, really appreciated being part of this webinar as well. I, um, I do think that we need to collaborate in order to uh, all be successful. 
Um, I'm particularly interested in public-private partnerships because I think that is, uh, that is the way that we're going to be successful. Um, and uh, the labs are a big part of that, and as well as industry uh, such as Oak Glow and TerraPower. Um, we're all working on similar things, and, it's, um, and we can learn from one another. So thank you. Thank you. Bob, do you mind uh, adding yeah. next? So I'd like to just add a little bit here. Um, um, well, the first part of my comments will reflect a lot of what Steve already had to say is I think the, the well-recognized benefits of fast reactor systems still exist. They haven't been taken advantage of in the commercial sense yet, but they still exist and those benefits um, can be utilized and there's both excitement and as well as technology and that technology has matured some. The big change in the last decade is in the United States at least, companies that are working on this technology, looking to move it quickly, taking it to licensing as Oklo has done, um, getting ready to demonstrate it. And I think one thing we're going to see, you know, if we can get back to where we're actually having some, um, to take from the advanced record demonstration program, you know, real reactors doing actual demonstration, I think you will see a whole new set of lessons and a whole new set of improvements to this technology because Light water reactors didn't come out of the box with the performance they were able to get. You have a whole level here that demonstration is going to get into that we can learn from these reactors and improve them as we go forward in the future. Likewise, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Bob. And I want to thank each of you for joining me today. So Steve, Bob, Tara, thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, it was a good discussion to start to just tap into some of the things that are going on in the space that are both exciting and motivating to us, but also just a preview of, of things to come on this webinar. Um, so uh, I also just want to give a quick shout out to Bonita Chan, who helped us on the Oakland side organize this and will help us going forward. Um, big kudos to her for putting this together. Um, so with that, we'll be hosting a series of these going forward. Uh, this will not be uh, the first and last. Instead, it's the first. Um, they will be announced um, as these you know, as we get them on the slate, uh, I think we'll do things at a relatively high frequency, not at complete regularity, but we're aiming to do something every two to four weeks. Um, with the next one focusing on discussions around uh, closing the fuel cycle with fast reactors. And that will just be part one. There will be several of those that really highlight some of the cool things going on and some of the innovations occurring. So in between uh, technologies going on in terms of fast recycling, supported by different advanced reactor types, different recycling techniques. They'll be spanning a variety of conversations. Uh, again, these will be these are being recorded and they will be recorded and we'll be posting them later. Similarly, we didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, that's a great thing. That means there's a lot of excitement and interest. Uh, we'll be capturing these questions and we'll be doing what we can uh, to basically try to archive them and answer them in different formats, including either in future webinars or even kind of an FAQ type basis um, uh, that we put information together. Uh, so Again, really appreciate it. Um, we're excited about what the future looks like for Fast Vision. I think it's a really incredible tool in mankind's arsenal um, to deal with climate change, as well as just broad global uh, empowerment, frankly. Um, it's a pretty neat thing to do when you can tap into and take advantage of a huge amount of the energy that's stored in the actinides on this planet and not just necessarily scratch the surface of a percent or less. So uh, again, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, and with that, we'll be, we'll be wrapping up today. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah.